Welcome everyone. This is the second AI series and today we have two amazing speaker, Tina and Lisa. They are such thought provoker, bring full heart, full emotions into this very important AI series topics. And I am your moderator, Evelyn, and I am going to head it over to Tina and Lisa. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, and thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. We are thrilled. And Lisa is going to bring up our uh, presentation. But before we start, I just want to. Um... It was me there. There you go. Can you see it? Yeah, hopefully, everyone can see my screen. Risk management for AIPM. Great. Yes. Awesome. awesome. So I want to start with um, a little bit of a conversation, um, actually, and I can share this too. Um, this morning I came into work and one of my teammates um, were in tears and it's because of the political um, events that recently happened. And outside of that, you know, we just came out, we still are dealing with a lot of COVID things and we still came out, coming out of the pandemic. A lot of us are dealing with not only work stress, but also personal um, pain and suffering. And I want to let you all know that I see you as much as I hear your pain and I, if, and I would love to share your success and whatnot too, but this is why we have this community of women. This is why we are here. So bring your full self. And, you know, um, this is a safe place. And I'm so honored to be amongst all of you. Um, and to I'm super excited to present this, but also wanted to let you know um, that we see you and we hear you. Lisa? Yeah, thank you, Tina, for sharing that. I think definitely one of the many things I value about the women product community is that it's always a safe space, right, for us to, sh for me personally, to show up and be authentically me. So yeah, thank you for sharing free context. I know it's been challenging times as well, just to, for the last two weeks, really. And um, yeah, again, I hope everyone is safe. I hope everyone's family are okay and not impacted and yeah, just my heart goes out to everyone. Yeah, so I think with that said, um, we can dive in. I know it's six past the hour, so we can probably get started. And um, again, as you can see on the screen, if you don't know why you're here, just to set context, we're here for risk management for AI product managers today. And yeah, if you're in the wrong room, this is a good time to run on, um, but this is what we're gonna focus on today. And moving on, I think we'll start with a quick intro of Tina, the instructor. So there's a long text here around Tina, but I won't dive into too much of all the details and all the amazing things that Tina does. But um, for a quick intro, Tina is one of my mentors who I connect to via the Women in Product, gee, I think two years ago now. Um, and at the time, Tina was in a whole other company, right? And she's currently the SVP of Enterprise Data Risk Oversight Strategy and Analytics Leader at Truist, which is a financial fintech company. And when we initially proposed this, we proposed it as a talk for a women in product conference this year. And um, I think that kind of evolved into a longer discussion, especially once generative AI kind of, you know, took off. We're like, wow, risk, that probably warrants a two hour or longer conversation beyond just a really nice 30 minute scope talk. So that's kind of how this has evolved. And yeah, Tina, are there any specific call outs you'd like to share from your intro? No, thank you so much. You did much better than I would of introducing myself. So <laughs> thank you so much. I think in terms of, you know, um, moving from the product role to now leading an oversight um, AI products, right? So I think that I would never imagine me being like in this position, but I am so grateful that I get to do this now. Um, and it is a great 
place and a great time right now to talk about risk management for AI products managers, because it's something that I believe now it is in, uh, and we will talk more about this too, but it is a part of our jobs, right? It's not like, hey, this is something we should think about, or it's not, it is here, it is now, and it is what we need to do as um, pro uh, AI product managers. So I'm very excited that we get to do this and we get to do this now. Fantastic. Yeah, so swiftly over to myself. Um, my name is Lisa Huang Noor. I pr my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm an East Asian woman, long black hair. I'm wearing big um, big earrings today because it's always fun to present to a main product. I get to jazz up my outfit and wearing a floral top. So yeah, I'm currently a senior product manager at Microsoft. And um, on my in my day job, what I typically do is focus on building products around cybersecurity space. And um, specifically, it's protecting customers and their users from cybersecurity attacks. And that's how I think the intersection of risk management very much come to the forefront. And again, um, with all the buzz around generative AI, right, and Microsoft's various announcement with Copilot, that's also how in my most recent current day job, I get to intersect with building AI models and such. So yeah, that's a little bit of about me. And again, very honored to be here. Really excited to share the stage with Tina as well as Evelyn, who I will introduce next. Um, Evelyn today is going to be a wonderful moderator. Uh, I think currently or formerly she was a senior product manager at Coursera, but also with over a decade of experience, right, across different industries, different functions, different complex challenges, including compliance. And so I think when the topic of risk came up, again, we're like, wow, risk and compliance, we don't really hear about it as much in women in product. Shall we get together and do this thing? And, and you know, I think the confluence of events led to this. Evelyn, is there anything you'd like to highlight from your experience? I think you did an amazing job. Um, I just wanted to say thank you all, the community, the audience for being here. And um, right now I'm looking for what's next. So um, love to connect with you all afterwards and see what's up. Yeah, excellent. Great. So before we dive in, I think um, with the chat as well, it would be wonderful to maybe hear from folks to add in in the chat of where you're dialing in from and kind of what piqued your interest, I think, around risk, specifically in the AI product management context. Yeah, so feel free to add that into chat. Great, Ariana, thanks for adding those questions. Yeah, and I think while that's flowing, we can talk about disclaimers. Since we are on the topic of risk, there shall be disclaimers. Um, I think this is very in line. So yeah, Tina, do you want to kick us off on the disclaimers? Yes, ma'am. Next slide, please. Oh, are you not seeing the disclaimer slide? There you go. I, you know what? Um, I've been locked in into this room because of privacy issues. Uh, <laughs> so it's a bit slow here. I. I tell people that I have a quantum computer. Um, so <laughs> anyhow, disclaimer. So the views and opinions of, uh, expressed in this presentation by Lisa and I and Evelyn are of those of us and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the organization hosting this event, AKA the woman in product or our employers. So, um, you know, just wanna let you know that we build this presentation from our experience as well as from our own personal um, uh, knowledge of the topic. This presentation is also for informational purposes only. Uh, obviously, please don't take this and say, this is risk management, right? It is a huge topic and please consult with your own risk group within your own company for your own specific circumstances. But the point here is that we wanna give you basically a risk management 101, an overview of what it is for AI product managers. Um, and it's really much as a teaser for you to continue to do more research and um, learn more about that. And again, if you would like, if you see the work here and would like to kind of distribute the information, please uh, connect with us to get the uh, copyright uh, and uh, IP. So, uh, or women in products. Anything right. else you miss out on disclaimer? 
Yeah, no, I think that covers it. And um, again, we've chatted with my women product team. So I believe the slide deck will be distributed after. And all of you as attendees also have access to the full recording via, uh, via the Matchbox platform, I believe. So yeah, again, know that you will have access to slides and feel free to take as much notes or as little notes <laughs> as you want. And that's relevant. Yeah, but I think that's pretty good. Any questions top of mind before we dive in to the content? Checking in chat, checking in. Okay, so looks like we are good. Super exciting. All right, so I think we can look at the agenda for today. And broadly speaking, we've divided it into four sections, right? So first we'll talk about the PM's role in AI product risk management. And then we'll dive into a lot of the, I would call it the meat of risk management 101, you are likely to encounter new terminologies that you may or may not have heard before. And um, as we go through, we'll also share examples and illustrative things from our experiences. And we'll also be looking at external frameworks, right? Because then that's something which you can use industry standards, especially when conversing with your risk management team, as well as your management chain. Topic three, we're going to go through an example of actually identifying risk while building an AI model. And so that will be a bit of a case study. And finally, we'll have practical exercise where you're going to be put into breakout rooms. And I see we have about 30 plus participants today. So Evelyn will help us break groups of probably four to five people per group. And really the goal is for you to practice what you have learned right away because repetitive learning, right? Best to put it into practice. And yeah, given that it's a two hour workshop, we will also have two five minutes breaks built in, bio breaks, grab water, whatever you want to do within that time. Again, if you do have to log off, right? Feel free to, this is going to be recorded. So prioritize what you need to do for yourself, your family, and um, no worries about going off camera if there's other things that's happening. It does help for me though, I do have the screen of everyone on screen because I think with virtual presentations, it's always nice to see people's expressions. If, if you're comfortable staying on camera, that is very much appreciated as well. Yeah, we have um, both Evelyn as well as the WIP team who's monitoring the chat. So as questions pop up, feel free to pop it in the chat. If Tina and I are not looking at it at any moment, the moderators can come and say, hey, 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 um, Catherine from the audience has a really good question, right? Can we pause there real quick? That's totally fine. We want to keep this interactive as possible and so pure lecture style. who are just kind of talking out loud for two hours. Great. So moving on, by the end of this workshop, will we start with the bottom line up front and what's in it for you? Yes, user-centric. And um, Tina and I have determined that here are some of the key takeaways you will learn by the end of this workshop. You'll understand a PM's role in risk management, again, within the slice of AI product development, because risk is a very big topic. Um, by the end, you should be able to explain the importance and challenges of risk management for AI products to peers, to stakeholders, right? At least ask informed questions so you can start having those conversation with broader teams. You should be able to identify key stakeholders for risk management, maybe new teams you haven't interacted with before. And just we think of it as threads to pull <laughs> so that you can engage in deeper, further conversation. We will share case study, so, and you have the breakout room. So by the end, you should be able to perform at least the first layer of risk analysis in the context of AI product. And finally, discuss or begin to reason about how you would incorporate risk management into the product development cycle. Tina, anything to add or solid so far? Solid, let's keep going. Great. All right, so what is the state of AI today? And um, I will be talking through the section. Tina, feel free to jump in. And on the screen, we'll have a picture or image of a nebula, because I think that's very much how I feel about AI. It's just the new frontier, but there's a lot of nebulous things, and we don't always know what's happening in AI. So looking at AI, I think even though generative AI has been top of mind um, since November last year, and it's all the buzz keyword, but the reality is AI has and is already here. 
right? So here I'm referencing um, McKinsey research studies. McKinsey has been conducting state of AI surveys since 2019. And this was from their 2022 review. Um, you, you will have the reference link here. And it's around the AI use cases across their survey participants. So as you can see here on the left, um, it's a graph showing the most common AI use cases by job functions. And I wanted to call out the second one, which here at least 20% creation of new AI-based products. So that's probably something that's most relevant on top of mind for the audience here, given we're all PMs. But I think it was interesting to look at how AI has been used in service operation optimization. So chatbot, right, being I think a very common one you think of, customer service analytics, anything that's insights and telemetry related, segmentation, marketing, advertisement, targeting, um, new way on enhancement of products, again, product top of mind, so and so forth. So that's on the left, which is use cases by um, top use cases. On the right is the use cases by function, which is for the drill down, right? You can see that under product or and or service development, creation of AI products or AI-based enhancement of product is the most common one. So with that said, AI risk management is also already here. Just as companies have been using it since 2019, risk management functions have been here before time, right? Like since the ancient dinosaur days. As long as there's companies, there's risk. And um, one of the terminology, we have these posted yellow as well as inherent risk. So inherently with any business processes and with any operation, there are inherent risk involved. Using a very common example, if I'm driving to the grocery today, there's inherent risk of me driving in a vehicle and going out onto the road where other humans or other actors are involved, right? So there's inherent risk, even just in me stepping out of my door, driving to the grocery store. Same thing with business. By selling a good or service, there's inherent risk built in with transactions, facilitating the transfer of product services to a different group of user, right? So the, inherently, I think the key takeaway here is there are inherent risks already built into the business, whether AI is there or not. And going back to McKinsey survey, um, they also talk about what risk that organizations consider are relevant in the context of AI. On the left, most left top, you'll see cybersecurity being a key one. And I think you've all seen news articles around hacking, ransomware, phishing attempts, right? So cybersecurity is top of mind. Regulatory and compliance, another big one. And we'll dive into that a little more later. Privacy, if you've heard the terms like GDPR, CAPR, right? Regulations around securing users' private information or personal identifying info, PII, that's very much top of mind as well. But contrasting that with a graph on the right, and the graph on the right is from 2023 and specific to generative AI. And I think what's interesting here is on the left column, you have what organizations consider are relevant risks versus on the right, showing what organizations are working to mitigate, right? So you already see a very clear gap there, even just looking at those numbers. Data inaccuracy, 56% of organizations think that's a relevant risk, but only 32% of them are working actively to mitigate said risk. Another big one that has a gap, I think, is regulatory compliance. 45% know it's risky. Only 28% of them are doing something about it. Right. So this is where, again, key takeaway is there's inherent risk in business. There's inherent risk in AI related items, but not everyone knows how to mitigate or even manage said risks. So even though AI is here, even though risk management is here, yes, we still have companies getting um, penalized for not managing said risk. And yeah, I think from even four years ago, right, 2019, already big tech was getting $5 billion of fine, such as Facebook's. And this is but a fraction of the revenue and yet 5 billion, right? No joke, still a decent amount. Um, two days ago, so this was all very recent data, we see that in the most recent conflict between Israel and Palestine, TikTok is in the crosshair of news tagline, right? Of now Europe 
already saying to companies, hey, yes, you are a social media platform. However, misinformation has very real impact on current civic and current war situations. So that's another type of risk, right? Both regulatory, but as well as broader considerations around ethics and data privacy and accuracy. Um, you also have watchdogs find, finding Equifax. I was surprised to see Equifax is still alive and breathing, but yes, Equifax, 13.4 million. So these are just some taglines around that gap between acknowledging risk exists and actively doing something to manage said risks. Yeah, so I think with all that said, we come to the question of what's a PM's role? How does this involve you who are here in the audience? I'll take a pause. Tina, anything you want to add before we dive into this section? No, I think that's, um, I hope the information is kind of telling you the evolution of risk management. And then soon as we'll be addressing risk management in the AI products manager. The, 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 the terminology, the yellow post-it that we mentioned for you, you will get it in the glossary by the end of this session too. But really for you to start thinking with um, like a risk practitioner, right? We're not training you to become a risk practitioner, but at least you can catching up with some of the terms they throw, we are throwing out sometimes. Inherent risk, residual risk, risk appetite, all that kind of thing will be mentioned here. But also you need, you kind of just, want to know what do they mean by that because if you are confused about the term all of that confusion will roll up to assumption about the risks and then when there's assumptions then you will make decisions based on misunderstanding of that risk management is an extremely if you start working with risk manager you will see that we are so precise and then the word that we use because of the risk once it is misunderstood it can be huge so that's why we giving you those terms and please pay attention to that because once you starting and it, I hope by the end of this um, workshop here, you can start hearing things and you're like, ah, I know what that means. I know what they meant by that, right? So that's the point of all of this terminology for you. Yeah, great. Yeah, so join us just as you're an astronaut exploring space into the jungle of risk management of AI. And here we'll say that really around risk, PMs are here to the rescue, right? A new term is you are on the first line of defense. And um, you've probably all seen this image of it was never addressed. And PMs are very much that, right? Which is risk is inherently a part of our role and responsibility. Also translating to we can be held accountable for certain risk especially during the product management process. And we'll dive into that more. I think there's also the aspect around expectations, right? Which is how do your stakeholders and how do your management chain as well as beyond, what do they expect of you as a product manager when it comes to risk, especially in the AI context, right? So we talk about regulatory, we talk about some of those external impact, but internally, what does other employees what does your engineering team or what does your risk management and governance team expect of you as a PM? But even more so, what does your end user or customer expect of you as a PM? How, how do they look to you to safeguard their data, their privacy? And if you're in enterprise software or any sort of B2B software, right? How are you helping employees achieve workflow without adding additional risk? to their environment. So I think that's a really big one where I, whether you're B2C or B2B, there's gonna be different kind of customer expectation and implication of risk when they use your product or software. And the bottom line, impact on business. Uh, we've already seen the taglines, we've seen the news headlines, so you know where the bottom line is. So as a responsible heroic PM, how does risk impact your job, right? And I just pulled up some of these recent job titles. Um, of LinkedIn. And interestingly, you do see risk peppered across your job description, right? And if you haven't been applying for jobs recently, um, I think um, as a trend to note is how the PM role has evolved over time and how now it's not just limited to senior PMs, right? The top two job listing is principal level, which is very senior ICs, but even at quote unquote, entry level, such as a technical program manager role, right? The risk and managing cross-functional dependencies is also built in into that responsibility. 
So how about protecting users and why is risk management important? Again, headlines. As we all know, our products have very real impact out in the wild on real world situations. And um, just some headlines from recent years, starting from 2018 all the way to 2023, right? When you're thinking about what can PMs possibly do to protect users and why AI have potential consequential impact from bias crime detection to racial bias in housing to disabilities and resource and services, right? Um, I think really the headlines is just a good reminder for when we are building product, the very real end user and societal impact that could happen. And how about your organizations? How can you protect your business and organizations and help mitigate risk? Again, we see a uh, ramping up of regulatory discussions. We see things around elections and war, misinformations. We see um, both in the US as well as abroad, right? Europe again leading the way or AI governance. But increasingly, I think we're going to see this spread across more than just the European zone as well as the North America zone, but other countries increasingly adopting their own flavor or their own governance and regulatory functions around AI. And lastly, this is a wonderful slide for us to look back to accountability, which is when the time comes, should the time come where your company's highest leadership are called in front of government officials and say, hey, tell us why this happened. Tell us what happened here and what transpired leading to this discussion and testifying. Even though it may be the highest leaders who will be speaking in front of congressional hearings, right? Internally, um, as we try to do a retrospective on how things happen the way they happen, it's gonna come down to the first line of defense, which are people who are on the front line building the product feature and making those decisions around what to build and what models and what mitigation controls are in place. And that's where really um, tying back to a PM's accountability in risk management. Tina, over to you. I know this is your, your coin the term, so please go ahead. I did coin this and I actually told my husband uh, this and he was like, did you really say that? I'm like, it's a safe place and I trust these women. Therefore, the oh shit PM is what we're gonna make you become today, right? So really, and, and um, actually we dress it up a little bit too with the cape again, you know, heroes are not all that wear capes. The cape here is that you're gonna come in with your risk lens that you're gonna be wearing to protect your client, protect your organizations, and protect the people uh, around you and the world that we all live in here today. So I think, you know, number one, I hope by this time, you kind of a bit scared and like, oh, I don't know much about uh, risk management. Or maybe you say, that's right. I've been saying this for years and nobody pay attention to risk. And now it's about time. Either where you are on the spectrum of that, um, I hope that we kind of get to you the, the importance of risk management in your role as AI products manager. It is not a wish list anymore. It is now uh, an accountability. It is a job. And it is where the AI products manager can succeed. Um, you know, just to, to, to put a little bit more color, we, when, when I hire products managers, um, I always ask that, right? I'm like, how do you mitigate risk before you roll out your product? And if you don't know the answer for that, that is a big red flag now for me. Because at the end of the day, we don't get to be the cool ones who just roll out AI and just say, hey, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see how it goes. No, because everybody is now paying attention to that. So if you don't have all the guardrails or don't know or not paying attention to that, you're missing out on the boat. The boat's already left. And you got to get on that. So here's the exciting part of it. This is the right time. We all heard the news that AI leaders uh, and practitioners and researchers are asking actually for more regulations, for more policy and procedures and all of that stuff, right? So right now, if you're on the boat, you're on it. We're going to get you to stay on the boat. And then we give you all the term all the tools you need to begin saying, okay, where do I go next now that I'm on this boat? 
Yep. And I think the bottom line is your users will be more secure because of you, right? So, so I think that's really a positive note, which is, well, this may be slightly scary or anxiety causing. At the same time, remember that it's opportunities and it's something we already do as PM, right? Em embracing ambiguity, ramping up and embracing a growth mindset to learn new things. Risk will now just be another tool in your toolbox that you can leverage as part of your job as a PM. Great. Um, just monitoring here to see if there's any questions from chat before we dive into risk management 101. Okay. I don't see any questions. Excellent. All right, then let's get ready for takeoff, which is AI risk management component. So I think to start is how do we define risk, right? We've already talked about inherent risk. And really, if you're looking for a definition, um, risk is the measure of an event's probability of occurring and the magnitude of the consequence of the corresponding event. Right. So going back to my very um, verbose ex example earlier, what is the risk of me walking out of my house and getting into my vehicle? Right. And there's a lot of regulatory requirements around vehicle safety, for example. So that helps reduce my personal risk of getting into a vehicle. Now, when I do drive on the road, obviously there's traffic rules, there's people taking driver's tests, right? All the different measures or controls in place to lower the likelihood of me as an individual in my motorized vehicle getting into some sort of accident. So really risk management is trying to reduce the probability of occurrence or reduce the size of consequence, right? Magnitude or degree of consequence. And when we think about risk management itself, what does that define? Yeah. As product manager, I used to thinking of product development life cycle. Risk management has a similar life cycle, right? You start with identifying risk, and then you assess the probability of occurrence or the size of consequence. And then you start looking at ways you can control or mitigate these risks. Again, reducing probability or reducing size of risk. And any unknown, right? Of course, we'll always have unknown unknowns that's outside the file purview, given the information we have at any given time. But those are the kind of assumptions and um, information to note down. Hey, this is all the things we think we know at this given time. There may be unknowns. And this is how we will deal with it when unknowns pop up. Now, AI risk management is also strategic, right? So if you're one of the way you're trying to demonstrate your strategic thinking and strategic muscle at work is to really start engaging in those conversations around risk management. And effectively in AI, specifically thinking around things like data bias, model accuracies, what are the cybersecurity vulnerabilities or what the attack surface could look like, any ethical dilemmas we should be thinking of around biases and fairness and equity, compliance issues. How do we align or fulfill the GDPR requirement if you have business operation in Europe or even as um, granular as state, right? If you're operating in California, how do you meet the California CAPR? Effective AI risk management ensures that technologies are developed and employed responsibly with safeguards in place. So this is something you hear us talk a lot about. Um, safeguards, we may also use the word controls in place. And again, it's about reducing the probability of something happening and the size of the consequence should that thing happen, right? So, so I think that's really the keyword there around risk. On the right, I have a diagram. Um, this is from Deloitte, as you know, consulting houses, all kinds of frameworks. So this is one way you can think about or reason about risk. And in the Deloitte framework, within AI management specifically, right, they've divided it into five categories, model risk, specifically to do with AI modeling, financial risk. This is a lot of the business bottom line stuff we talked about, reputational risk, branding, marketing, what happens when your CEO shows in front of the Congress, operational risk, more tactical, right? What are we doing at the front line or first line of defense when we are creating models, enhancing models, incorporating AI technologies throughout product, and then conduct risk, which is a lot more to do with regulatory as well. So the best analogy we could come up with <laughs> is around lenses. And if you've been to an eye exam, 
recently or ever, you may recognize this device on the right, right, which is switching out different lenses to help you calibrate and for um, the eye exam and to determine what your degree is, right? How, how are your eyes health doing? So the analogy we have is all of you as PMs and as women in product community members already every day wears the lens of product management, right? That's how you live and breathe. And your um, friends and family are probably tired of you asking, so what's a user case here? What is the pain point we're trying to address, right? Like you live and breathe this stuff. We don't need to talk about the PM lens. You already have that. What Tina and I are trying to give you today is adding new lenses to say, so what does this look like when you apply a risk lens? And additionally, what does this look like when you apply an AI? product development lens, right? So think of it as additive instead of replacement. Now, risk lens, and this is where it's going to um, probably have a lot of keywords. And remember, you have the glossary. I think when you apply the risk lens, you can think of both macro environment, right? Things outside of your organization, as well as more micro things that happens within internally in your organization. So starting with the macro lens, how does what, how does a AI product or algorithm they are thinking about deploying? What are some of the ethical consideration of that to broader society? What are some of the external regulatory and compliance issues that you should be mindful of? Does it have any sort of national security implication, right? And this is where depending on the product, it may or may not. And um, one example I share from my personal experience is Prior to Microsoft, I worked at a satellite imagery company. And satellite imageries are very much, when you think of it, it's like, oh, cool, Google Maps. That's a satellite imagery that I use as a normal human, right? But there's a lot of national security implication to satellite imagery. When you think of monitoring and um, reviewing certain sites of interest and what new development are happening in said sites of interest, right? So if you are working in a context where your software is being used for any sort of government use case, national security may very well be a consideration you need to think of. And earlier we talked about employment or crime detection bias, right? When you really peel back layers and start at that level, which is who will be employed into the government? What are some of the validation or vetting or even you know, uh, applicant tracking system? How do they define who will be reviewed for an interview? And therefore they are interviewed and now they are in government and now they're in government and running the controls of, I don't know, a nuclear plant, right? So it can go down as far as employment vetting and how does that translate into national security? Um, yeah, so again, environmental impact. More broadly speaking, does your software have any influence on and what is its environmental impact? You've probably seen in the news that AI models are very compute intensive. It takes a lot of electricity and those electricity and computation happens in data centers and those data centers require water for cooling and electricity. How does that impact the environment and what are some of the carbon footprints as well as other energy needs for doing something as easy as recommend the next product I can buy on Amazon, right? So these are some of the broader external risks to consider something more internal to your organizations. When I create a product that uses an AI algorithm, what new cybersecurity concerns should I be considering? Can this increase phishing attacks where bad actors or you know um, hackers can try to fish one of our employees so that they have access to our secure internal information? Organization reputation, what happens when things go bad? How, how are we gonna, what's my CEO gonna say in front of Congress? That's how I think about organization reputation. Um, vendor and third-party risk. As part of your model, are you building your own AI algorithms? Probably not. You're probably gonna be using something from OpenAI or white label, but underneath it's OpenAI. So how are you gonna manage risk of any third-party data dependency, right? That your engineers do not have control over. They are buying some algorithm, supplier, service model, and you're using it in your product. And when things go wrong, can you explain why things went wrong? And can you explain what controls were in place to help mitigate those third-party data provider risk? And then physical safety. 
um, if you work in an IoT environment or work with any sort of frontline worker, right? How does AI may or may not impact humans' physical safety in the workplace? So again, these are more kind of organizational, but also um, narrowed or intersects with AI product. And finally, a gigantic list of AI PM lens, right? We just talk about broader risk that can be AI agnostic, right? You still care about national security, whether you use AI or not, but specifically within AI. And given that AI is really just a fancy word to say, that's use programming to get a lot of data and do some magic black box calculations and spit out some result, right? I mean, it's a very complex mathematical model. Um, so what are the intellectual property and copyright infringement? How are you acquiring training data? Where is that data coming from? Are they user generated? What is the source of data information? Once data is consumed, into my calculation? How do we maintain privacy, confidentiality, especially if we're gonna use user data from our actual customer to build in the model? How are we thinking about privacy on that? Data bias, fairness, don't need to go into detail, but there's, you know, harmful bias can have consequences. Model reliability. How do you ensure that your models output today will be the same three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, right? What, what's the reliability controls in place? And explainability and interpretability. So explainability, for me, I think about if my mom came to me today and say, hey, Lisa, you build this product, you have an AI in it. I'm your mom. I have no idea what AI is. Can you explain to me how this works? Can I explain how that works? Can I answer any of the flow of questions, right? So, so that might be, a, that's how I think about explainability, which is at what level of sophistication and how technical do my user have to be for me to explain something for them to know how it works. Now, interpretability is more around, hey, with the output, right? My AI model spit out something. Can I explain it? Does it have enough context? Um, uh, an example, I think if you've experimented with chat GPT, is if you ask ChatGPT a question and it spits out an answer, do you know the context which is explaining? Is it attributed? Can I find the original source of the article that it's referencing to give me that information, right? And the answer might be yes or no, but what are those risks and how do you mitigate those risks? Yeah, Tina, do you want to add to the AIPM lens? Yeah, so ladies, it's not about all of this stuff that you need to know. So I'm hoping you're not feeling like, holy cow, how am I supposed to do all of this stuff, right? It's more about these are the considerations that you should know about. And then we will give you the stakeholder list for you to say, who do I go and ask for this, right? So as AI products managers, your job is, is not to say, to set a policy on privacy, no. But it is your role to go when your mod, uh, your your data or your features being built out and then about to um, to be rolled out or edited in your product, you are supposed to ask, okay, now are we in line with the the privacy policy or standards um, that we have with our company? So I think these are the types, the lenses that we are saying to you, so that when you before you launch your product. These are kind of like your checkpoint to say, okay, did I check this? Did I check this? Did I talk to the right people, right? Or did I assume the risk and, and just completely forgot about these aspects? A lot of times, and I, I, I was reading one of the chat comments, like, hey, I work in X and Y industry and really want to know how to apply AI um, in product management, but also mitigate the risks. Now, from a risk practitioner perspective, mitigating the risk it's less important than identifying the risks. Because if you say, oh, there's no risk, well, then you don't mitigate nothing, right? So I think the first step is really understanding where are all the risks? Have I considered all the risks? So it really is peeling uh, away the onions when Lisa talked about the macro, the external, the internal, and then the AI model itself is really, have you thought through peeling all the onions layer out? And have you checked 
to see if the middle has a little bit of like, you know, a dark piece in there or in when you cut the onion, is it really at the core already rotten, right? So then all of a sudden you push something out and when others, the thing is, if you don't peel that onion yourself, somebody else will. And when they find that rotten core that you didn't find, that's when, oh shit, things happen. So it's, that's what it is, you know, really to figure out at the minimum as AI products manager, what am I supposed to ask? What am I supposed to look at? And then we'll tell you, how do you do that? Great, thank you. Yeah, so this is very much the who do you see through these lens section of it. And um, Lisa, yes. before you move on, yeah. um, may I ask the question? Because sure, that's a ahead. lot of information. And I'm yeah. looking at the chat. Karen was uh, capturing what Tina was saying about an onion. I'm curious because you guys cover a lot of the risk factors, but sometimes risk and product has this tension. One wants to move really fast, especially if it's like zero to one, it doesn't have a product market fit. Risk is about, I want to check all the box, to ask all the questions. Where do you start in terms of a product development cycle? And then how do you sort of trade-offs between moving very fast versus we have to be careful at identifying and assessing all the risk before it becomes a shit moment? Lisa, you want me to take first and then you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Evelyn, that's a great question. That is an expectation when you put on your lens. Okay. So there will, if there is a world where the risk practitioners and the sales team and the product team and the engineering teams are like, hurrah, we are we love each other. I believe that somebody is hallucinating in that world. Um, so know the expectation is you will have friction because then when you don't have friction something is going on that nobody is looking at okay so it's a great question so set the right expectation first as ai products manager when you come in you should tell your teams your engineering your sales your marketing team and said i'm going to ask you hard questions and these questions i believe will make us more successful, but it also will make us take, might be a step back, or we might have to get to the right governance, which we will talk to you, escalating this um, so that leadership will tell us what to do next, right? So usually when this happened, and this happened to me all the time, so I, I think when I said I was the cool Tina AI, right? I come in when I was a practitioner in the AI team, People want me. It's like, Tina, come and help us with this, build this out. You know, we have a GDPR. Uh, um, we have to comply with this and we need to do X, Y, Z. And my team comments, like, we build this, blah, blah, blah. Boom. And we launch and people love me. And then all of a sudden they're like, wow, well, you know, this is great. But Tina, we're going to move you to the second line of defense where you actually now have to look at the risk of the product that your team just built. And I'm like, oh, shit. Okay. So that's where the OSHA PM happens, right? Because I'm like, we didn't check um, that we actually, our products was in line with the risk appetite with the company or not, right? We didn't do that. We didn't even know what risk appetite was. And we didn't even check to see if, you know, uh, if we have controls to mitigate the inherent risk. We didn't even know, we did talk about inherent risk, but we said it's model risk management team, their job is to figure that out, not us, right? So all of a sudden when we almost out to ship, the compliance team comes in and just, no. I mean, that took us two months from zero to one product. It took so much money. And when compliance come in and no, we were like, what? What is happening here? So I think Evelyn, the first thing is, Number one, come in and set the right expectation. Is it going to be not a comfortable conversation, but is it helpful and it will be for the success of the product? Number two, what you would have to ask is, okay, have we list out all the list, uh, the, the risk, the inherent risk? And then I will show you, we will show you another term is called residual risk. You have the inherent risk of all the things you think that could happen. And then you ask the next question is, what are the controls, right? Or, you know, another terms 
um, that is non 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 risk is like uh, the the safeguards, for example. What are the control in place to mitigate the inherent risk? And then you take the inherent risk minus the control, you get something called residual risks. That is the risk where you say, I've done everything, we've done everything, we consider everything. These are the residual, residual risks that we still need to, to, to figure out. Now, when the residual risk is out there and you have a list of that and you consider the impact and the scale of that risk, you would then ask the next question of, is the residual risk that we see in line with the company appetite for the risk? If it is in line, perfect, ship it out. Get somebody to sign so you don't get choked for that one, you know? But if it is in line, perfect. Hey, you know what? We did it. We did everything. But if it's not in line, the next thing you would do is you need to escalate this, right? There's a governance process for risk management where you say, we, we did our risk analysis, we see these are the list of inherent risks, and we have a calculation per the company's policy, whatever you have to calculate that risk. Um, and, you know, CEO, if you're in a small startup or, or leaders or small, or if you're in a big corporation like mine, you would go to your risk department and say, okay, what is the next governance or committees do I need to talk to? Because now our residual risk is outside of the risk appetite. And that is out of your hands. And then it's back to the right people, the risk group who are trained to do that. I hope that helped. Yeah, and I think I'll just add one more thing. Going back to the risk definition, right? Which is magnitude of risk and the size of consequences. So that, I think that's another lens to look at it, which is again, depending on the maturity of the company you're at, right? If you are a zero to one seed stage, series A, series B startup, and you have like a handful of customer or less than a thousand customer, right? Like that's your potential size of impact. That's gonna be very different from a multinational that with millions of users and the size of that impact is gonna be much larger. So I think that's one way to think about it too, which is, hey, what is the current use base, user base, and how does that help us quantify the size of potential impact? Yeah, great. Okay, so who do you see? Um, as we were saying, there's line of, or line of defenses, and this is just one model to look at it, right? And um, Tina already went into some of this, which is what questions do you ask and who through the questions you ask do you identify? So we, I won't go through all of them verbatim, but I think the key one is what are the roles and responsibilities for each line? Because as long as you know who you need to talk to and what they are supposed to be doing, right? Now you will know, okay, who do I follow up with for conversations and what are they accountable for versus what am I as the PM accountable for, right? Like you're not going to be accountable for all the things, but identify who your key stakeholders are will help you delineate between Great, model risk, the model risk team does it. Governance, governance team does it, right? Risk appetite, the compliance team does that, right? Just have that. And I think uh, key takeaway from this slide is questions you ask as well as document, document, document. <laughs> Make documentation is your friend. So as you do this research, note it down somewhere. So again, if anything happened, you'd be like, hey, this was the exercise we did. These were the people involved. These were the sign-offs that we had and therefore, yeah. Um, and for this one, Tina, would you like to speak through this one? Yes, ma'am. So new term alert. This is called risk taxonomy um, or and it's basically what kind of risk functions are your company considering? Again, if you are in a bigger company, you should ask. And if you don't know it by now, you're going to sound so freaking smart when you come and ask your managers about this. Like, what are all the risk taxonomy of our company? And we're like, what? Trust me, this is going to make you look awesome. So basically, you know, and, and as a, uh, this is just one example of a risk taxonomy for a company, right? Your company might have different type of taxonomy. It could be, you know, right here, if you look at this, the risk category is financial risk. Um, and right here, financial risk has liquidity risk, market risk, and credit risk. I work for a bank. This is a real thing for us, right? So if we have market risk when interest rate go up or down, that's a huge risk for us. So that's one bucket. Business risk, 
or client risk or reputational risk, operational risk. Again, companies tend to have the core risk, which is operational risk, strategic risk, you know, reputational risk and whatnot. ESG is a new risk because new regulations are coming out, right? So, but do ask your company, what are the risk taxonomy and how do our products align to that taxonomy? So for example, back in the day when I used to build, um, you know, AI products for fraud. So the fraud risk was under the business risk taxonomy, but it has a leg into a lot like the reputational operational and all that kind of things, right? So how does your product line sit in what taxonomy and how does that also connect with the rest of the risks within your company? That's number one term. The second term is now that you know the risk taxonomy, there are different level of the risk uh, the risk function. So, you know, for example, there you go. Then financial is level one. They call it L1. And then some people will say, you know what, this is L3 in the in the risk taxonomy. That means that, okay, so you have the umbrella of the risk and under the risk, these are the child level of each of that level. And within the, those levels, there's another child level, right? So you want to know, where am I? Where are our group under for the risk taxonomy? And with that, you then will figure out who are your partners, who are your impact and all that kind of thing. So new terms alert. These are most are very important when you start thinking about risk within your company and just appearing super smart. Yeah, so if you see these two slides and have never seen those graphics before, this is an excellent place to start, right? If you only take away one thing from this workshop is you go back to your company and you ask your manager, what's our risk taxonomy and where do we sit in that taxonomy? Like if that's the one thing you do today, this workshop was successful, right? Like you had that question and now you'll gain that knowledge which you may not know before. Great. So where do we start? And I want to make sure, okay, great, perfect. We're at a five minute stretch, stretch break. I was like looking at the time. Okay, so we'll take a break. And once we come back, um, this is where we get into a case study element where we will apply the NIST AI risk management framework um, using a very specific scenario. So yeah, um, I'm just looking, it's currently 12 noon in Pacific time. So we'll come back five minutes after 12. Well, five minutes after the hour. And I can take questions while we do the five minutes because I know Lisa, you've been talking the whole time. So uh, I'll take this five minutes or while you go take a break. Um, Cheyenne, is that the right? I, I'm so sorry if I butcher your name, I suck at this. So I apologize in advance. Um, if you work for a company that likely doesn't have a risk taxonomy, what's a good way to start? If you don't have the good way is, well, when are we gonna get it? <laughs> so, if you have a product and you do not have, in, or your company don't have a risk management function or just risk management person or something like that, you are in, you already very much behind. And if you are thinking about AI, pro, uh, AI to apply to, uh, on top of your product and you don't have a risk taxonomy or you don't have a risk management uh, department or again, a person or something, a policy, you shouldn't be applying AI. That is what I would say, because regulations are coming, regulators are coming for anything that AI or machine learning, right? So you do not want to start working on something and roll it out without having a documented, um, policy procedures and taxonomies and whatnot to rely on. That is your truth or your Bible or whatever that you call. So I would say, ask your founder, uh, most of the time, big company have this, smaller startup might not have it, but ask your founder, have you invested in just having somebody do this for you or you know, build it out from the in, from in-house? Because let me tell you this, if you have time and really, listen, you can YouTube, Google this, onto all of the congressional questions for all those companies and startup and founders. The questions that they ask are the most fundamental risk questions. So if you are about to embark on a journey of AI and you don't have this, 
just imagine yourself in front of all of these uh, regulators and say, I don't have it. And then you will see the impact, uh, you know, orange jumpsuit doesn't look good on me. So I work for companies who actually have um, risk management framework. Next question, back in the day when the, um, yes, awesome, risk taxonomy, great, Carmen call out. Um, yes, and then Amy, you said like, end user adoption could be under business. Again, it's up to your company where your function or where your group is, just ask that question so then you know where that lies, right? And then you know who your partners or your impacts or your products might be impacting from the top uh, level, as well as when you ask where you are in the risk taxonomy and ask what level you are. So you know for a fact, if you are level one, perfect, and what is the enterprise policy or whatever for you to align to. If you are level three, how many other level of policy and procedure do you suppose to align to or the risk appetite you're supposed to align to so that you are not outside of that risk appetite which is talked about? Okay, any other questions I can answer? What should we consider? Planning timeframe for rear bay. It seems like it's not. Um, Great question, Ariana. So what should we consider in terms of planning? So to be quite honest, when you build um, your product, I'll always have, you know, if you do sprint, have a sprint for risk uh, management, right? You see, that's to start, to be quite honest. But if you are in a mature and more uh, established company already, risk questions is always within the sprint. And so we built that in, it's become like a BAU for us. It's not a thing, but if you are from a smaller group and it's not a, a, a practice yet, I would say put those um, bookends to start. Okay, we are about to build us new features using AI. What are all the inherent risks we are thinking about in when we build this out at the beginning? And then in the middle, you should say, have we think about all the controls? Remember the inherent risk, controls, inherent risk minus control equal residual risk. So at the end, before you launch your product, you can say, okay, we thought about all the possible risks. We thought about the controls or the safeguards that we put in. We now know our residual risk before we launch our products or before um, we do blah, blah, blah to the next stage here. Let's make sure that all of our uh, residual risk is aligned to all the levels and align to the company risk appetite. So I would say just chunk that in, um, in your time of uh, AI products. And it doesn't have to be a, a, a drawn out process and like months and months and months, right? Because you are not there to create the risk management framework. You are there to just make sure that you check the boxes that you thought about it and you talk about it. And you escalate when you start seeing issues. Right. Okay, I think we are back. Yes, thanks, Tina, for fielding those Q and A's. Um, before we proceed, and any other questions? Uh, I see one in chat. Actually, two. Uh, are we going to cover inheriting the risk profile and controls of third party tools? Any advice on influencing third party tool roadmap and security capabilities? So I, I think we're not going to dive specifically into that third-party tools, but I think um, broadly speaking, the questions, right, as well as the terminology, especially when we come into the like AI model and such would be relevant questions. And um, I'm so putting myself in the shoe, if today I were asked to say, hey, we're going to acquire a third-party software for AI algorithm, right? Like that's going to be an algorithm that powers some feature. The same questions I will ask my data science team is the same question I will ask of that third party team, which is, so tell me about the controls y'all do and what is your authoritative source? And we'll talk about some of that terminology. So I think that's relevant. Um, and then the next one, which is startups that do not have risk and governance team. I think Tina already covered that, which is they shouldn't be using AI. Or um, if they do, make sure someone signs off and say, yeah, we don't have a risk and compliance team or officer, and we don't plan to, and yet we shall use AI. Document that somewhere, have that on paper, 
say that you validated that you may disagree and commit right like at the end of the day you are there at the pleasure of the company so if that's the decision they have made and insisted on document it yeah and then just a note on the third party too right um again what we are doing is kind of creating a framework for you to start thinking um with the lens of risk uh, ai risk management but also one thing i always always tell my executives um and also my teammates and and everybody i see is you can outsource a function but you cannot outsource the risks so if you are buying a product that you having uh, offshore people build something or do something, at the end of the day, the company owns the risk and will be punished accordingly due to the risk. So please, um, like Lisa just mentioned, when, when, we, when you ask the question internally to your people, you're, you should be able to ask the same question to the third party, right? And, and your vendor, because at the end of the day, remember, remember this. You can outsource the work, but you own the risks. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent questions. Really good questions. Okay, so we're back. Uh, as you have seen from the earlier part of the presentation, right, there's a lot of AI risk management frameworks out there. And again, do a quick search online and you'll probably find a whole myriad, right? Deloitte has one, McKinsey has one, any of the big four consulting houses have one. Um, for today, we are going to use an example from the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, acronym is NIST. This is one of the frameworks. You can or not use this one, but it's the context we're going to use. This was um, announced or released in January of this year, so pretty fresh, hot off the press, and there's a lot of accompanying information, explainer video, perspectives from actual customers or um, large companies that they work with, the playbook as well as the in-depth multi-page framework. So all of these links will be available to you when you have access to it. And yeah, really the goal of this, as you can see, the version 1.0 <laughs> is designed for organizations to incorporate trust worthiness considerations into the design, development, use, and evaluation of AI services, products, and systems, right? And at a high level, this actually, I think, does map pretty closely to the product development process, which is starting with that yellow or top left quadrant, application context, plan, and design. Similar to product management, you start with business goals, user pain points, understanding the use case before you even think about solution, right? And then move into data and input. In the case of AI, it's collecting and process data, but in the same thing with product development, right? Once you understand the use case and you're building a solution, you also need to collect and process data. Moving into bottom right quadrant, AI model, Specifically for AI, you are verifying and you are, you are building the model, and then you are verifying and validating the model's accuracy and such. Similar to products, you build a software product slash feature, you do need testing, right? And you have QA controls. Make sure that it's working the way it's supposed to work, and your engineering team have unit tests and integration tests. Same idea, right? Model or not. And then finally, deploy and use. In the case of AI, it's about tasks and output. Product. Similar analogy, right? You go to market motion. Once you test the thing, it works. How do you release that? How do you deploy it or ship it to prod, right? So this should be a pretty mappable framework in your product management lens, and you're familiar with the product development lifecycle. Um, again, this is just kind of it blown up into a circular frame. We're looking at it horizontally. It is a linear path in this presentation, but you can go back and forth between different stages. It's very big. We're not gonna go through all of it for today, the case study, we're really just tackling the three in the square, which is data and input, which is around collection and processing of data, AI modeling, building and using the model, and then AI model verification, right? How do we validate the output? So th those are the three areas we're gonna focus on. Please feel free to read NIST framework if you like details on all of the other stages as well. And, oh, sorry. Ah, okay, great. So this is the case study, and this is one that Tina's going to walk through. And um, the prompt here is 
congratulations, you have all PMs at Amex now, <laughs> American Express, you have all American Express PM now. So put on your FinTech PM hat. And um, really what happened is your data science team has built a wonderful AI model for fraud detection, right? You're a credit card company. There's going to be credit card fraud. Your data, your data science team built this model. So now they come to you as a wonderful PM say, hey, look, I have a present for you. I built the AI model. Would you like to integrate this into your product? And the question is really, so now you as a PM, wearing your PM lens, now adding onto risk lens and now adding onto AI PM lens, right? How will you identify risks involved and get sign-offs before you deploy this and add this to your product? Over to you, Tina. I, um, let me know if you want me to progress the slides. Awesome. Okay, so we threw a bunch of new terms, so we're not gonna highlight them for you. Um, but let's just do this as a framework together. And again, this is a very, very basic 101. Um, so for you to kind of like, okay, now I know what the lens of the risk management look like, right? So please, um, there will be a lot that you will need to kind of dig deeper and whatnot to if you want to. But if you are say, I'm just gonna start it right now and I don't wanna be overwhelmed, this should be sufficient enough for you when you, uh, this framework should be sufficient enough for you. So let's start. Number one, when you think about AI, what is it? It's artificial intelligence, machine learning, machine-based learning, all that kind of thing. It's a model, right? It's a complex algorithm, um, but you can't build a model unless you have data. So the first thing first is you have to think about the data collection, just like the NIST framework and like how Lisa just kind of put it in the product management framework. So the data collection framework, number one, your question should be, what are the authoritative sources that you get your data from modeling team? Most of the time, these questions should be in the some somewhat, you know, something called model risk management, right? So when your AI team come in, your engineering team comes in and said, I built this amazing model for you. And you should just, you know, um, plug that into your current uh, products there or edit that and whatnot. Your question would be, okay, sounds great. Number one, have that gone through model risk management approval? Oh, no. Well, I'm not going to do that, right? That's the first question. But if it has, let me just do a little bit of a double check. Authoritative sources. Did you get the data from the right data lake or the, data, the right data uh, asset, wherever that your company put it in, right? Versus like, you know, we just build it because we kind of took like 50% of the data from here and put it over there and from here and over there and, uh, because we wanted to build it really, really fast. Wow, that's your first red flag right there, right? How do you then can say the model is accurate if the data itself is not authoritative enough to even build the model on? And then the intellectual property rights and everything else. The term here is what you want to know when this whole data collection piece and the data preparation, the two terms I want you to remember, write it down here is data at rest and data in motion, okay? So, when you look at the data piece and data collection and prep, the data sits somewhere, the engineering or the or data scientists come in and grab that data and move it, right? So at first, data at rest, is it protected? Is it actually new data or is it stale data? Has, you know, is this data supposed to be used or is supposed to be deleted a long time ago? Those are the, the, the risks, the risks the inherent risk that the modeling team or your policy and everything else have to um, uh, consider. But knowing what, like, what framework am I asking for when it comes to data is data at rest. When the data is at this stage, is it ready to be cooked, right? I'm, I think about food all the time. And right now it's like 316, which is my snack time. So I'm sorry when I, I, I migrate to now food uh, analogy, but if you have the chicken and you wanna make chicken uh, noodle soup, you have to say, is the chicken, was it chopped? Was it actually plugged? Is it actually still good chicken? You know, has it been there for like five years? I'm not cooking with that, right? And then when you move the chicken from your fridge over to now your kitchen, that's data in motion. When you move data from one place to the other, usually what the engineering do and the data scientists do because of 
the way data scientists sometimes think. I used to be one really bad one, but that's what I used to think is I don't want to build the data in the data um, assets, right? And you're not supposed to actually, because that's where the data address is being protected and following compliance and other policy. You move the data from one place to the other to start testing and training your models and whatnot. When you move it over, is it complete? Is it accurate? These are the data quality integrity um, elements that you should ask. So when you move it and it landed another place, so there's data address, data in motion and data at rest again, right? So you take from one place, you move it over and you put it into another place. Is the place you put your data, for example, somebody mentioned they work for a company and you have PII, personal informations, right? Well, I'm really hoping your data scientist not taking name, social security number and all that kind of thing from a data asset that's been com in compliance with privacy law and re data retention law, and then just plop that into their personal laptop like, oh, I'm going to build it because it's faster in my laptop, right? Well, dude, you're going to be wearing orange jumpsuit very soon. So that's just the thing. So data address, data in motion, and back again on data address are the, the faces all in compliance, the right thing. Then you move into data preparation again, data integrity. Again, it's like accuracy, uh, completeness, and all that data corruption was when you move it over, did you did something breaks, right? Did some of the feature got dropped, or all of a sudden it got changed from numeric to category, you know, to uh, a, a different type of um, data? I can't think right now. I am really hungry. Sorry. Data date loss. formatting. I think date formatting is a good Thank example, you. right? If you go from yeah. month month date date year 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 to date date month, month, year, 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 year. Congrats, you've just corrupted your data from its source moving into a new place, right? And everyone's birthday has now switched. Mm -hmm. And then fit for use is another new term alert, right? Your, your question should be, when you take the data for your model, did you take the data that actually was fit for the use of modeling? So did you really interpret the data piece correctly, right? If I if this piece of data was used for another thing and then the modelers think of it as for another thing, that is all wrong and your output's gonna be wrong. Privacy, again, hey, are we even allowed to use this data? So somebody said they work for the insurance company. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to bring in PII to build AI models, right? So sometimes data scientists would be creative and they would use different things to create uh, their feature for their models. So, so just ask for that. And then when you move over to build and train an AI model. So if it's just a simple logistic regression, or if it's a you know large language model using GNN or any type of uh, neural network kind of modeling, you don't need to know all of that stuff. What you need to know as AI products manager is the model result, is it biased against a population, against a process or something like that? Have you checked for bias? Your data scientist should say yes to that. And if they haven't, you might be screwed. Explainability, interpret, interpret, I can't talk, and model reliability. Again, this is this is basically the framework when anybody use to build a model. So when you think about Chat GPT, even though it's a huge thing, they start with the data, right? Remember, and they said our cutoff of our data time is 2021, blah blah blah. But then the result is talking future things. So now. You know, so that's where all of this is happening. It's like, okay, what is happening here? Why are you telling people this? And, but your result is different. That is because they didn't have the checkpoint or they didn't like update their policy and procedure or their models or some of the modelers are using new data without the consent of the company or the people, right? So think about that as like now you going through these steps and then getting to the model and the finished products um, before you add it to your product. Great. Right, Lisa. Yep. So next slide. And I think as we mentioned here, it's really around all prep, right? How do I get the data? What do I do with set data? And how do I use it to train a model? And I think the next piece is around what happens once your data science team, going back to the prompt, 
you're an AMAX PM and your data science team have happily run over and be like, here, I have a present for you. I have an AI model for you. Don't you love it? Don't you love me? Please put it into your product and let's ship the thing, right? This is where we're going to get to. You now have a model in hand. What happens yep. here? So um, let me talk about this a little bit. So now as a, uh, you walk through and you say, hey, hey, data science teams, the data, go back to the first slides, please, Lisa. Um, so for fraud detection, most of the time is what they're going to have to do as a data scientist team is, okay, they have to have a target variable of like, these are the frauds that, you know, we predict. And then they kind of train the model to figure that out. So you ask, okay, where did you get that data from? Again, for your fraud um, AI model there, did you actually take did you steal somebody's uh, model code from, uh, you know, Kaggle competition and bring it down and just kind of apply that, right? If you were to do that, um, just an FYI, did you check on that for copyright with your legal team and whatnot? Or did, when you build it out, or did you actually take a black box model to build this, right? So if you were to build, to buy a black box model for your fraud detection AI, you need to go back to the vendor again and ask the question of like, okay, so help with the explainability here. How did you take our company's data and then spit it out to that? Because again, we cannot outsource the risk, right? So you have to make sure that your vendor answer that question for you. And then when you say data address and data emotions and whatnot, so you keep going, ask these the same. So the, what I'm trying to do is, it doesn't matter if you are AI product manager for Amex or for Amazon or for True, it's where I work at. These are the questions in the framework you're gonna keep thinking about and asking, right? And then when, when usually for a fraud model, for example, the model bias is extremely, extremely important, right? So you can ask like, are you, um, is your model just telling me that a bunch of people with the last name win, for example, or a bunch of fraudster, that's my last name. Um, that's bias. You know, you can be like, okay, something's going on. You need to show me how you came up with this idea. Because the moment when we throw out this model out, guess what? Somebody's going to come and ask, why did you always identify this group of customer or this group of people as fraudster? You better be able to answer that, right? So AI fraud model, and especially in the financial industry, we have to be able to explain every stage. So sometimes a data scientist, a data science team will choose a type of model that is less accurate, but easier to explain in front of the regulators, right? And that's the job of the product manager is to negotiate that piece. Some, as data scientists, we want to pump out the best thing. We want to be able to like, you know what, this is going to be using like GPUs and it's going to be like 90% accurate. We're going to do this and this and this. And, but we can't explain to you like how it happened. And, you know, if we are biased, it's, we really aren't sure why it's biased. Okay. All of that awesomeness from your data science team will be a failure when your product is launched and your customer comes in and said, what the heck just happened? You know, so these are the questions that you ask and especially in the industry that you are in, please ask those questions. So again, as Amex PM, you need to be able to know what are all the authority, all the uh, authorities that are regulating me, right? So we talked about GDPR. CDP, uh, CPRA, we talked about, you know, the Fed, you know, as a, a financial industry, we also regulated by the state. We are also regulated by the OCC and the FARB. And I mean, I don't even know how many more people want to come in and regulate us, but that's what we do. And we have to make sure that everything that we do aligns and in line with and in compliance with all of that rules. Next slide, please. There you go. And so once the AI model is complete and all the step here, the, the things that you need to ask at the right, um, the aligned risk to compliant to company risk appetite, this is the, the so what of your risk management. This is the so what of your pushback and your question is you go back 
to you know your your data science team's like you know what screw you i don't want to listen to you and i want this um ai solution to be added to your product and you can say okay sounds good you know what you didn't want to listen to me so now i'm going to go to the enterprise risk team or if it's a startup with one person i'm going to go to that one person and ask is this in line with our framework? Is this in line with our uh, risk appetite, right? What is our limit here when my data science team saying that they build this amazing thing, but they can't explain it? Is it within our appetite? Or if it's not, somebody have to sign off on it. I'm not signing off on that, right? And then the escalate, and then also the halo effect. If you are in a corporation like mine or Lisa, how does, you know, and then now you are uh, Amex, right? If there is risk, if you're creating a fraud um, detection for your product and there's error on that or there are issues on that, the halo effect of your risk taxonomy would be the operations, for example. So you building a model that use a lot of energies, GPU and all that kind of things. How is that model and the fraud that it catches really impact the operational efficiency, for example? You have to consider that, right? And if you catch, if you go out and you keep blocking somebody's credit card because you say, you know, uh, we detect fraud on there, but it's not fraud, that's reputational, right? Could the customer would stop using your card because it's like you would dump. Why do you keep blocking me when I want to use your card? And then that go into your financial risk taxonomy when you all send a bunch of your client um, drop using your products, right? So think about the halo effect of where your risk is and then have that impact others. So then you can go back to negotiate with your data science team and said, you know, if you were to launch this out, this is on you, all of those risk. So usually it helps a ton when I go back to my uh, AI team and said, you guys, I know you're amazing. And I know that you are okay with the risk limits that you are exceeding. And I just want to let you know, here's the list that I have of risk. Could you please sign off on that? So then I can launch that products with your wishes and nobody ever did that, right? So what, what it is, is just really help speed the negotiation up a little bit. And then the risk acceptance process is what we call the escalation process of the governance. The word here is the governance process of your risk. If the appetite is out, if the risk limits is uh, already exceeded and whatnot, your next question as the AI products manager again is, who do I escalate? And who has the authority to sign off for any of the risk acceptance in here? Because if the wrong person sign off on that and you take that piece of paper and you come back, it's like, I have a sign off, but it's like, uh, that person even doesn't even work here. Well, that's not gonna help, right? So, <laughs> um, so risk governance process. I hope that helped. Yeah, and I think you share a lot of good examples to think through the end-to-end -end basis, right? Which is really going back, um, again, if we look back at the slides here, starting with, hey, transaction data, if we're talking about MXPM with fraud detection. So are we getting transaction data from secure or authoritative sources? And do we change or corrupt the data, for example, with date formats and such, right? And then when we choose when we're training and building that model, are we building everything in-house versus the third party vendor that we're using and leveraging and how they are controlling for biases? And then based on that, again, evaluate the output and do sampling, do testing and say, all right, do we see the accuracy and can we explain it and interpret the outcomes? And finally, before even after all of that work, right? It's still not a straight to production, ship it. It's still a matter of checking with the stakeholders that you previously identified, right? Maybe a risk officer, maybe an entire team of risk team, risk governance team, and asking all of these keywords to say, all right, based on our appetite and based on our limit, it seems like the model we have built is within the limit. Are we all good? Everyone here, we're all comfortable, sign off? Okay, great, let's ship it. If not, it's not within the limit, it's higher than our company's risk appetite. 
Who do I escalate to? Is it my manager, my skip level, the chief product officer, the chief executive officer? How far up do we go? And who is ultimately accountable for accepting that? Yeah, it's higher than our risk, but we're willing to do it. Yeah, and I'll pause there to see if there's any questions in chat. I think there's only one. <laughs> yes, Karen's comment that risk management is a game of hot potatoes. A little bit yes and no, right? And I think this comes back to that accountability model, which is if you are in a larger, established, more mature company, risk management has always been there, right? It's before AI even comes into the picture. So they should already be a structure as well as full-time employees and entire teams built around it. But if not, if you're not in a mature company, you're in a smaller startup, you are in a seed or, you know, pre zero to one product phase, then the question is really around, okay, so have anyone thought about this? And if so, who is it and who is accountable, right? So I think it's less, risk doesn't have to be a bad thing. I think if we come back to why we're even doing risk, it's really about securing our customers and protecting our business and organization from unintended consequences that could kill the entire company, right? No one wants to be wearing jumpsuits. No one wants to be sued or going in front of congressional hearing. And that's why this is a good faith discussion to say, how can we secure our users and how can we protect our company and do our due diligence upfront? I think that's a key one, which is, hey, I'm not here just to knock on you, um, scold you, right? Or I'm not here to discount your work. That's not it. I appreciate your work. But how, how do we make sure our customers are secure and we don't throw the company under the bus, right? Yeah, so let's take a five-minute breather. We'll be here if anyone has questions. But feel free to go stretch, take bio break and whatnot. Yeah, and feel free to come off mute if you have any questions. Happy to answer. So Lisa, I do have a thought and it could be a question too. Uh, so if you've heard of companies that focus on securing workloads. Uh, as an example of this could be Protect AI, which has just earned like, I believe it was like a $35 million round of funding. Um, and they're looking to secure machine learning workloads. You know, how do you, in your expertise in your background or maybe in colleagues, uh, place those companies in the market and Put that put those companies in the framework that you you and Tina have put together today. Is there any way that you think about those kinds of, you know, it's almost like they're trying to be the heroes to to help in a, in a more bolstered way, um, larger and smaller companies with their transition to the use of more AI. Yeah. So um, I'm not familiar with the company, but I think. What you are describing there, if I understand correctly, is a company's, the value proposition is that they will secure AI models, I assume. So I think that at a glance, without knowing much more about the companies, I would say probably fit into that third party element, right? Which is, hey, as a company, I am not building AI models from scratch. We're not going to build that in-house. Instead, we're going to buy off the shelf. For example, buy from OpenAI or whoever else is out there. And maybe instead of me having the ability to govern and control risk of open AI, right, whoever I'm buying the model from, I'm going to use another third party, which is this secure AI company. So I think if that's the case, then that's a risk evaluation process to say, hey, we want to buy an algorithm off the shelf. We don't know enough about the model risk that's involved, and we don't really know how is the best way that we can answer all these questions around how that model is built. So we're going to outsource that and use a company called Secure AI. They claim that these other questions, they will verify or they will chat directly with the company. Maybe they have a list of recommended algorithm providers because they go through some certification process, right? And, and I think if that's a case, that's effectively your control. You're saying as a company, we recognize we need to use a third-party algorithm. As a company, we recognize we don't know where to start to control the risk for that third party. So we are going to work with a company who seem to know what it is. They have all these accolades or compliance, regulatory certification or whatever, but using the info we know, they seem legit. 
They are used by other big companies. Here's the names of all their other big customers. And again, given the info we have right now, them doing it is better than us doing it. And we have done the due diligence to say, yeah, we're going to trust them, right? Trust Secure AI to do the vendor management or vendor risk calculation for us. And in that case, our risk is now, quote unquote, limited to us plus Secure AI and not the actual end algorithm, right? And again, if things happen, we've tried to mitigate or minimize the size of the consequence or the probability of the consequence by saying, yeah, this third party, you know, other big tech companies use it, other banks use it. If they fail, everyone's affected, right? It's not just me. So that's the best we can do given the info we have. We trust them. So, so I think as long as you're going back to explainability, if things happen and the company's reputation has been dragged through the mud or you have to go in front of Congress, at least the CEO and the company's founder can say, hey, look, we did our due diligence. We found companies who say they can do the risk management. Other big companies use them, right? We're just a small fish in a big pond and other bigger fishes also use them. So we trusted them using that. And, and that's explainable, right? I think that's a legitimate example. And no one can ever say I'm 100% sure that there will never be a risk, right? It's about the control in place. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. That was super helpful. Uh, and I also brainstorm about things like if these companies that have more multiple customers gain insights about the regulatory compliance rant landscape, as well as all the different ways right. these can be hacked, uh, I wonder how they're informing uh, other companies and training, right? So that the folks yeah. in the exactly. risk departments can become more upskilled, uh, perhaps for, for the latest and greatest. Uh, but back to you guys. Yeah, I think using a more relatable example is financial auditing, right? You as a company have CFOs and finance team in place and they do their own accounting and do their best effort in making sure their books are solid. But once a year, if they are big enough, right, they also subject themselves to external auditors, such as EY or Accenture or whoever. And they are saying, hey, look, this is a third party, completely independent. We, we pay them. They do the audit of our books and they sign off on the audit of our books and say, well, legit, we're not doing any corruption or money laundering or whatever, right? So if you trust EY, you trust them to audit our books. And that's the best that can happen. Now, should something happen to EY and their audit standards not up to par, that's not me picking the wrong person. That's now every client of ENY will be impacted, right? So, so I think financial audit is an example. AI might be new, but the concept of audit and trusting a third party independent auditor has always been there. Great points. Thank you, Lisa. Of course. Okay, great. So I know we're back in time. Um, Evelyn, do you want to open the breakout rooms? And um, while Evelyn's doing that, again, um, in this context- Lisa Oh, Sorry, ahead. do you want to do 10 minutes? We are uh, 12.42. Sure. Or do we want to keep it eight minutes? So yeah. we have 10 yeah, minutes. Yeah, so let's do whatever. eight minutes. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll do eight minutes. But again, the prompt here, as you can see, it doesn't really matter who you are, but you're a PM, you got an AI model from a data science team, and you're asked to identify risk, right? So in this context, it's a product recommendations model on amazon.com. That, that's the prompt. Yeah, so I think we're gonna go into breakout rooms and then folks can talk through some of these items. Welcome back, everyone. Not yet, 45 seconds counting down. Oh, there's a countdown, okay, all right. Well, I hope that was a fun exercise. <laughs> oh, awesome, Karen, good to see you. Good comments in the chat, always nice to see. <laughs> <laughs> As an ex banker, all the finance analogies. Oh, like, God. oh, I feel the pain. <laughs> I, yeah, um, when you mentioned it, I, that's where I got the hot potato from because I think in banking, at least on my end, and when I did it, it was more like let's push off the risk. But the good yeah. faith analogy really, or the the approach with good faith, makes a lot more sense, and it's a lot healthier rather than let's shape let whoever has this responsibility. It's not us. Right. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ooh. I think we are back. Yeah. I kind of like this view. I get to see all the faces. Yeah. 
And we hope that was a fun exercise. So even though we're a little short on time, we won't necessarily go into the debrief verbatim on screen, but feel free to share in chat, right? I think at a very high level, we were curious to see what did you learn from that very short exercise? And if any additional questions that came up, we're going to go into Q&A, so feel free to ask. And then finally, it's like, how do you feel about risk management now? Um, so yeah, feel free to pop it in chat. And moving forward swiftly, so we have some time for Q&A is, as promised in the beginning, what we learned today. And I hope that all of you, by the end of this workshop, right, is feeling more comfortable, less anxious, less scared, less stressed. And you now understand the PM's role in risk management for AI product. You can explain or understand some of those terminologies. You know a little bit of who are the key stakeholders. You can start asking or probing, right? And how to perform a risk analysis, at least have a framework for it and ultimately bring that knowledge back into your team to say, hey, as a PM, how and when do I engage with risk management in the broader product development cycle? So yes, we hope you're feeling energized. Uh, you got this, you're awesome. You're a PM, you learn things all the time. Risk is another tool and another terminology you add to your dictionary, right? And, and now you'll be able to talk about it and ultimately, your users are going to be safer and more secure because of the amazing work that you do. And thank you for investing the time out of your busy day to come and learn about risk management. I think that's a big one. So yes, we'll now stop sharing and go back to Q&A. All right. Any thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Tina. Karen, do you want to share with all of us what your reflection and what your um question for tina and lisa is oh these are more of um questions to keep stock of from the the breakout session it is a it was a group effort but um i also just want to say thank you both so much this is so informative can't wait to bring this back to my team that's awesome thank you for sharing Karen, anyone thanks. thanks for keeping it interesting anyone? Food analogies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can always count on me for food. I will, I'll remember that. I was going to ask, um, how was the breakout session, everyone? Does anything jump out based on the what you learned and then the case study? Feel free to turn on your camera, unmute, and then uh, share your thoughts. This is great. People have no questions after a risk workshop. Oh my God. <laughs> Tina, we did it. <laughs> Man, I'm, we're so good. This is awesome. Okay, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> All right. Can, can Tina, Lisa, can you talk a little bit more about building and tra training the AI model? So under that you have choose a model, train the model. You know, we, we had our own interpretations of some of, of, some of it, but I, I guess I just wanted to hear you guys talk about it a little bit more. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about modeling, so now this is more of a data science aspect of it, right? Um, I haven't built models for a few years, so uh, forgive me if I miss a lot of that. But the the, the concept of uh, the the core of an AI uh, building a model is you take a sample of your data, right? Obviously, you cannot take all of that. So Karen has the questions uh, post all those questions to ask is how do you take the sample of your data? Um, and then from there, you chunk it out to a test. So within your sample, you would then chunk it out to a, uh, the population. Sometimes they chop it out to 8, 10, 10, 80%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 80% for you to actually uh, build the model and learn the model. And then 10% for you to test and then 10% for validation. That's you know something called cross-validation. There's cross-validation, there's different type of validation works and whatnot. So, when that happened, most of the time, and going back to risk management, when they build that model, you, your question is, how do you sample that? Was your 80% truly representative of the whole population, or is it 50% or all that kind of thing? So you ask those questions. And then also, one more question just to throw in there for you is, how do you treat outliers, right? Sometimes um, people will take out outliers, but those outliers will, might help with your bias issues. So going back to like ImageNet, 
back in the day when that was used for uh, you know image detection. And turns out a lot of the pictures in ImageNet were white faces and not um, people of colors, right? So, so you asked uh, for that outlier detection. So what happened is they the data scientist would take that and then depends on uh, is it you know there is it called generative learning or is it really kind of just like a predictive learning for your your type of modeling that you choose and sometimes they do something called an ensemble so you have like a bunch of models stacked on top of models that's when it's become a giant mess right so um that's when you know you think about the contaminations happens and the explainability and the integrity of the data out uh, the model output so the data scientist would take that they choose a type of models or an ensemble of models. They build that and then they take the result and they might build a bunch of other types of models to validate if their type of model is the right type first. And then they choose that models and then they choose that data set um, to say, okay, this is it. And you cannot build your, uh, you cannot test your model on the same data set because then it's called, oh, it, you kind of like, that data has already been trained on, right? It's gonna react to that models. Um, and then they will kind of help interpret that and give an interpretation to the business. Here's our accuracy range in terms of our target. You know, we are in between 75 to 80%. We are confident of our results, right? So usually data scientists never, a good data scientist should never give just at 90% accuracy, this is the result. Number one, that's called overfitting. You don't want to do that. That means you spend way too much time building, training your models um, on that data set. And number two, um, that's overfitting. And that's not a right thing for data scientists to do. Um, so, you know, that's basically is the gist of the, the modeling process is they decide to take the data, they chunk the data out so that they have enough data for train, test and validate. Does that make sense? Does it help answer your question? And it was awesome, Tina, you, this, your fount of information. I think the anecdotal question is, do product managers participate ever in the choosing of the model or is that typically something you rely on the data scientists to advise on? And you guys can move on to a different question if there is one. Great questions. I don't think that's, you know, to be quite honest, I don't think that's the place of the product uh, manager. Um, Personality-wise, most of my data scientists and my team were kind of on a spectrum and they always think they are the best in the world. And somebody coming in there and tell them their job, you are not going to build that relationship and definitely not building trust. So I think as AI products managers, just asking questions, ask kind of like, hey, so using that. Um, you are about to build this model. Help me understand how you did that because it's so cool, right? That would be an approach. I usually do that. I'm like, just help me understand because it's so amazing. And then they tell you and you're like, mm, all right, wow, that's uh, pretty bad. So I'm going to go over to my risk partner here and then just check in with them and just like, hey, you know, XYZ just built this out and um, I just see a little, bit, I'm feeling a bit concerned, but I'm not an expert here, which is true, right? You are not data scientists. So you can say, I'm not an expert here and I'm not a risk expert here. Could you help me connect the dots to make sure that I'm seeing this right and being secured and safe and sound? But I think know your lanes also is a good thing. It's like, don't try to over that. Thank you, Tina, very much. And thank you, Lisa. Of course. Yeah. And I think it relates to the question Claire is asking, which is if you do go back to the data science team and raise these questions, do you get pushed back, right, to update model? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I would say that, as Tina has just described, it absolutely could happen, right? And I think it depends on the culture and trust between the teams and what your operating model is like. Of course, if you're going to come across as, hey, as the PM, I think that was bad, change that, you're definitely going to get pushback, right? But if it's more of a partnership between the teams and you're saying, hey, I'm asking these questions because X, Y, Z, and look, Ultimately, I want to ship this, right? Like, this is really awesome. And I think it will create value for our user. 
but we can't throw the company under the bus. And I know the risk management folks are going to have questions. So this is me preparing you and us getting on the same page so I can advocate for the use of this AI model when I talk to the risk people, right? I think, again, going back to good faith discussions and saying, look, I'm not here to scold you. I'm not here to like kill a model. I'm simply doing due diligence so that I can help represent it accurately to my other stakeholders, right? Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, I know we are at time. So um, definitely, if you have any follow-up questions, I'm going to add um, both Tina and my LinkedIn links in the chat as well hopefully it works oh, okay it doesn't quite work this way give me a sec yeah but feel free to reach out to us i think there's also a slack channel that folks have access to so again you can reach out to us directly post on slack and um after this you have recording you have access to the deck which has glossary and questions and such so yeah i think that's going to be the best way to to follow on the conversation Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Tina. Thank you, Evelyn, and all the entire Women Product team for behind the scene moderation. Yeah. And all of you, thanks again for investing your time with us today. Thank you so much. Take care, y'all. Bye. Bye.